Good morning. My name is Jay Doucette. I'm one of the trauma surgeons at UC San Diego and director of the surgical ICU. I'm here today to talk about the use of ultrasound by the general surgeon, particularly in acute general surgery, in trauma, and in the surgical ICU. I have no disclosures in relation to this topic. Let's start with ultrasound of the abdomen. This part of the body is the region in which general surgeons have the most familiarity, and let's start talking about the gallbladder. The modality for choice for looking at gallbladder pathology in acute situation is ultrasound. It's fast, it's real-time, it's non-invasive, and does not use any ionizing radiation. For the detection of cholelithiasis, it has 95% sensitivity and exceeds that of uh, CT scanning. The visualization of a mobile hyperechoic intraluminal mass with acoustic shadowing is pathognomonic of cholelithiasis. For the detection of acute cholecystitis, ultrasound of the, ad of the abdomen and of the gallbladder has greater than 90% sensitivity. And the diagnosis is based on the presence of cholelithiasis, gallbladder wall thickening, pericholcystic fluid, and a sonographic Murphy sign. The ability to detect cholecystitis is limited by the skill of the operator and, of course, by the patient's body habitus. Here's an example of a still from an ultrasound looking at a normal gallbladder. The gallbladder is easily visualized as this dark object in the center of the field, which has some uh, post. Uh, 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 post-enhancement of, uh, of the cystic structure. The gallbladder wall is not thickened and there's no evidence of stones. Here's a gallbladder with stones. The stones uh, usually have uh, bright reflectivity and you can see they're quite bright here. Behind each stone there's acoustic shadowing which is a uh, path of mnemonic of cholelithiasis. Here's a patient who has both a stone and gallbladder sludge. <laughs> The stone reflects sounds quite brightly here with a lot of shadowing behind the actual stone. In addition, we can see dark uh, bile here with some sludging dependent within the gallbladder. Here's another picture of gallbladder with sludge present and you can see the layering of sludge in the gallbladder. No stone is visible in this picture though. Acute cholecystitis is picked up by the presence of pericholocystic fluid and by gallbladder wall thickening. And in this ultrasound, it's quite easy to see that the gallbladder wall is thickened, and there is also some pericholocystic fluid. Fast or focused assessment with sonography to trauma is the basic building blocks for training residents and surgeons for the use of ultrasound in the abdomen. It's a, a technique that should be learned by residents during the course of their general surgery residency. Here's an example of a fast exam looking at Morrison's pouch, which is usually the first window examined. The L stands for liver and the K is for kidney. Between the liver and the kidney is Morrison's pouch and normally you'll see the liver sliding over the kidney without any fluid present. However, in this plain ultrasound film, you'll see that there is in fact fluid sitting between the liver and the kidney. This would be considered a positive fast exam for trauma. Also examined at the same time is the subxiphoid window looking up towards the heart. In this case, we can see the heart shows up very well. The left ventricle and left atrium are here. This is the right atrium. But in addition, between the liver and the pericardium, there should be no black stuff, no fluid. However, in this example, the asterisk marks the presence of fluid between the liver and the heart, which is, a, which is pathognomonic of a patient with pericardial effusion or tamponade. Here's a patient who has a stab wound in the box, and although the amount of fluid here is, is small, it can be picked up. If you look posteriorly here, which is often the place that fluid is first seen, you'll see that occasionally a black line appears between the layers of the pericardium and the heart. This is typical of a patient who has pericardial effusion and may be having the onset of pericardial tamponade. The pleural spaces are also amenable to ultrasound, and using a flat vascular probe, it is possible to look at the pleural spaces and identify whether or not the patient has a hemothorax or pneumothorax. This can be done much more rapidly sometimes in attaining a chest x-ray, and may be the first indication in a trauma patient that there may be pathology within the chest cavity. This can be done using the normal uh, modes of the ultrasound, such as 2D, but also color modes and M modes can also be used. There are two findings in the normal situation. One is called the seashore sign using the M mode. The other one is called comma tails using 2D. Here's an example of fluid seen above the diaphragm. 
using a right upper quadrant view just higher than Morrison's pouch. The liver is this large granular object with the ductual duct skin within it. The bright line here is the diaphragm. The lung is not normally very well visible in ultrasound, but when it's surrounded by a fluid and collapsed, as it is in this case, you can see that there is black stuff above the diaphragm and around the lung. This is a hemothorax. There's fluid seen on both sides of the liver here. In addition, if you use uh, the M mode, you can sometimes see uh, a object moving back and forth in this area. This is the lung point sign where you actually see the tip of the collapsed lung moving back and forth within the pericardial correction, the pleural fluid. Pneumothoraces can be picked up readily as well, looking for the absence of comma tails, which are a normal finding, the absence of the seashore sign, or not seeing what's called the Doppler slide or power slide, or evidence that the lung is no longer in contact with the uh, parietal pleura. Things that are seen during pneumothorax are the stratosphere sign, the batwing sign, and the lung point. And I'll illustrate each of these. Normal lung sliding is quite visible. And if you look at this ultrasound, you detect that there is something between the intercostal spaces which is sliding back and forth. This is normal lung sliding, and there's a typical appearance of the patient without hemothorax or pneumothorax. Comma tails are bright tracks seen radiating away from the, uh, from the uh, pleural surface. These uh, are sometimes uh, said to be analogous to curly B lines, but what you're actually seeing are interfaces of the pleura and the lobules in the lung. And these are normally seen to move back and forth as a patient is breathing. This is evidence that the pleura is in contact with the uh, parietal surface and that there is not a pneumothorax present. If you want to have an extra way of looking at this, you can use M mode. And if you do that over time, you'll see that the motion of the lung in the far field has sort of a granular appearance. And this is called the seashore sign, whereas the layers of the chest wall appear to be the sea or waves. And this granular sandy appearance over here is the actual motion of the lung in the far field, the shore. So if you see sea over shore, this is a sign that there is, in fact, no pneumothorax present. The power mode can also be used to detect motion, as it's quite sensitive to motion in, in the field that's selected. And in this case, you'll see that every time the ta patient takes a breath, something bright shows up in the far field. This is the lung sliding back and forth. This patient does not have a pneumothorax. If a pneumothorax is present, one thing that may be noticed is that the far field is quite indistinct and no motion is seen. If one puts the machine into M mode and looks at motion along the line, it appears as if there is no distinctive uh, granularity of the distant field. All appears to be about the same. There's multiple layers present that don't seem to be much different near and far field. This is called the stratosphere sign. Also sometimes seen when a patient has a uh, pneumothorax is the uh, absence of uh, anything seen around the uh, rib edges. The two R's here indicate ribs, which do not transmit sound particularly well. And seen behind that is indistinct area. This is the so-called batwing sign because this doesn't change as the patient breathes. Sometimes a lung point can be seen. For small pneumothoraces, the lung may be intermittently in contact with the pleura or sliding back and forth adjacent to an area of pneumothorax. If this is the case, the lung will appear and disappear from time to time. And this is what you're seeing here. This patient has a small pneumothorax. And as a result, you're actually seeing the lung slide back and forth into the field. Airway confirmation after intubation can be obtained using ultrasound. This is a new technique that's still subject to investigation. But it has been used to quickly and rapidly augment the physical assessment of the endotracheal tube and to supplement methods such as end tidal CO2. The location within the trachea can be visualized directly. And in a study using this in comparison to chest x-ray, it took 17 seconds to confirm endotracheal placement, tube placement within the trachea as compared to a chest x-ray. It does not rule out that tube has been placed too far, such as in a right mainstem intubation. But secondary lung signs of ventilation, such as lung sliding, comatial artifacts, whatnot, can sometimes give evidence that both sides are moving equally and that both lungs are being ventilated. The ultrasound probe, particularly using the va flat vascular probe over the lower, uh, lower larynx or trachea, can, can demonstrate the position of the endotracheal tube. The endotracheal tube has uh, usually two echoes from the inside and outside uh, wall of the anterior part of the tube. 
And when the, t when the probe is turned lengthways, you can see both the individual cartilage rings of the trachea and this double line, which is the anterior wall of the tube. The distal wall of the tube can't be seen because the air within the tube doesn't really permit uh, transmission of further sound that can be picked up by the machine. But there's no uh, doubt here that there is a tube lying right behind those cartilage rings. This patient's endotracheal tube is within the trachea. Another useful technique for ultrasound and trauma patients is assessment of the volume status. The vena cava we often observe is collapsed in patients undergoing CT scan who are either volume depleted or in shock. The IVC can be rapidly identified using ultrasound simply by placing the probe in the right upper quadrant or in the posterior part of the right uh, flank and using the liver to help identify the vena cava. The vena cava is uh, usually seen to be uh, quite a large object. When visualized lengthways and open, it's quite easy to pick up. Here's a patient who's got collapsibility of their vena cava. Every time the patient takes a breath in, and they're not intubated in this case, the vena cava is seen to completely collapse. This is evidence that the patient is actually hypovolemic, and this patient may require further resuscitation if the patient has any other manifestations or concerns regarding volume status. Ultrasound has been used for the detection of elevated ICP in trauma patients. The optic nerve sheath diameter can be used as a surrogate for ICP in advance of placing a intracranial pressure monitor. The optic nerve sheath is actually an extension of the dura, and the CSF surrounding the optic nerve actually is contiguous with the CSF within the cranium. Typically, the cutoff is about 5 millimeters in adults. Some have suggested 5.5 or 5.7 millimeters as the upper limit of normal in adults, with smaller numbers used in children. Another use of ultrasound is the use of transcranial Doppler or duplex, which in experimental work has some suggestions that it may be able to detect a midline shift of the circle of Willis. Using uh, the flat vascular probe placed on the upper eyelid, it is possible to very quickly see the retina and the optic cup and both measure the optic nerve sheath diameter as well as determine the presence of blood flow within the uh, optic nerve artery. Here's a patient who has a ele slightly elevated ICP. Uh, however, their optic nerve sheath diameter in this case is only 0.32. This patient does not have elevation of optic nerve sheath diameter. The ICP at the time this, this picture was taken was approximately 20. This patient is undergoing transcranial duplex, which is a method which uh, Thilo Hoshberger has been looking at in the uh, division of uh, neurosurgery and neurosciences as a technique to uh, detect blood flow within the circle of Willis rapidly. This technique may also have some promise in investigations of the shift of the midline, perhaps uh, detecting the uh, early presence of a mass effect uh, due to trauma. Another technique that can be used to rapidly assess patients in critical care and acute situations as well as trauma is the FATE exam, the Focus Assessed Transthoracic Echo. This is done to quickly exclude obvious pathology within the heart, look at the heart's performance in a gross method, assess contractility, also to image the pleura on both sides to rule out hemo and pneumothorax, and then relate those findings to a clinical context. There are usually four windows used. That is at the subcostal uh, area just below the xiphi sternum, at the apex of the heart in the parasternal area, and sometimes uh, a little lower down in the, in the uh, sorry, I gotta do that again. The FATE exam is usually done using four windows, the first being the subcostal, which is part of the existing FAST exam. Also, an apical view sometimes can be used, particularly if the patient is able to roll onto their left side. And parasternal views are often used to, use, to see the heart in both the parasternal long and parasternal short axes. The heart on ultrasound shows up quite well, and particularly the left ventricle, when looked at the short axis view, is viewed as a cylinder or circular object and its contractility throughout the ventricle is readily identified. In addition, it's also possible in the same method as described previously to pick up the presence of pleural fluid 
or a pneumothorax in association with this examination. One of the things that can be determined rapidly is ejection fraction. This is simply done by measuring the fractional shortening of the heart, which is the diameter at the end of diastole as compared to that of uh, systole. And that fractional shortening multiplied by 2 yields the ejection fraction. This is a crude measure. can also be done qualitative just by using the eyeball, but gives some, uh, some estimation whether or not the patient's shock is due to poor cardiac performance, hypovolemia, or possibly due to sepsis. Here are some examples of limited echoes. This patient has black fluid all around the heart. This patient has a pericardial effusion. Here's an example of a heart that is beating somewhat well, but has not got great contractility. This heart has very poor contractility, and this patient has a significant cardiogenic shock. Now, this heart is not moving at all. This patient is in cardiac arrest. A revolution in the size and technology of ultrasound is upon us, and machines are now becoming smaller and less expensive. Handheld ultrasound machines, which can be carried literally around the neck or in the pocket, like a stethoscope, have uh, descended below $10,000 in price. These machines may have great utility in rapid assessment at the bedside of the surgical patient. This machine, made by General Electric on the left side, is a V-scan. This was first trialed at the Winter Olympics, and uh, the only limitation in this machine largely is the small screen size. However, it is uh, a fully uh, capable phased array probe. Uh, the only other issue with this machine, of course, is networking and battery life. However, as a demonstration of what is possible, you can see that this, these machines are going to become uh, quite ubiquitous. On the right, uh, an investigator at Washington University in St. Louis has developed a USB-type probe machine which allows ultrasound to be combined with smartphones. And uh, it may not be too long before you have something the size of an iPhone or a Blackberry, which could actually do uh, rapid bedside ultrasonography. Another technique which is available now for the ICU is the use of the disposable indwelling transesophageal echogram. This device is currently on the market. It can be used like an NG tube and kept in place for up to 72 hours after surgery. And patient can undergo continuous or repeated measurements of ejection fracture as long as someone is there to pull the probe into the right position. By continuously or frequently using the short axis view, it is possible to look at cardiac performance in a way that's probably more meaningful to most of us than the use of the Swangans catheter. Here's an example of what this looks like. The machine actually is using the short, gastric, the short axis view through the stomach, and it's possible over time to actually see the ejection fraction and co cardiac contractility, cardiac filling, cardiac performance. Here's another view of what that window looks like, and you can also see the, uh, the left ventricle shows up quite well. Finally, talking about billing and politics, some uh, surgeons still report they have difficulty getting credentialing for ultrasound. It's important to recognize that the Merit College of Surgeons, as well as other specialties, believe that ultrasound is not the perfume of a single specialty, but can, is used by all interventional specialties. It's also remember that important that within a hospital, ultrasound privileges are not controlled by uh, a single department, but actually by the hospital board and its pri privileging uh, uh, policies. Uh, nobody's the owner of ultrasound. It's used by every specialty. And the only issue within a facility is what actually is required to obtain ultrasound privileges. It's important that when in having discussions about starting ultrasound programs to talk about that you want to do ultrasound where radiologists don't want to be at the bedside in the emergency department or the trauma bay or the ICU or in the operating room at 3 o'clock in the morning just to do a limited exam to answer a simple question and to make a procedure safer you're going to have minimal to no impact on radiology revenue because you won't be billing the same types of codes that the radiologists do. And it should be important that every new sonographer is proctored and that the process is consistent uh, across specialties. Reimbursement, nobody gets rich doing ultrasound. The ultrasound uh, billing uh, is uh, actually fairly small. However, it is enough to pay for the machines and pay for the cost of the, uh, of the training. And uh, it's certainly uh, is uh, worthwhile doing this if you're doing this in volume and consistent fashion, so it's worth capturing these studies and billing for them. 
you have any questions or uh, want further information, there are links available at our website, trauma.ucsd.edu.